University Department of Social Work, of course. He's the chair, currently the chair and director of the MSW program at HSU and is responsible, oh was, sorry, <laughs> and was responsible for initiating a graduate program committed to rural and Native American communities. As a member of numerous boards and commissions in Humboldt County, Ken was involved with economic development, rural philanthropy, educational and social service organizations promoting poverty reduction, prosperity promotion, and social justice. Currently, Ken is the Title 40 Project Coordinator at San Diego State University School of Social Work and is interested in, as I mentioned, responsive and community-driven public services to promote socially just and culturally diverse practices for health and wellness. As a clinical social worker and a social work educator, Ken has an extensive history of working closely with culturally diverse communities and with public systems of care to improve social conditions. He actively supports holistic efforts for personal and community change. And um, I also just wanted to read a couple lines here of something he said to me before. He said, um, in the impact of CPS and other service systems those efforts should be place-based and attention should be on contextual changes to free human resources to improve safety and well-being of children, youth, and families. Title 40 programs should not be intended to be just workforce-oriented, producing new people to do the same things, but rather social work focused to change conditions and empower both workers and communities through a more responsive child welfare system of care, utilizing a more ecological, holistic framework to address abuse and neglect. I'd like to introduce Dr. Ken Nakamura. I need to do a little clarification. I'm not a real doctor. <laughs> <laughs> I'm an MSW. I'm licensed as a clinical social worker, and I'm a school social worker by credential as well. Um, I've been in the field for 30 years, um, got my master's at Berkeley. Um, the real doctor in my family is my nephew. He just graduated with his MD from USC. Um, I'm an MS up. <laughs> <laughs> but I've also been very lucky throughout my uh, career. Um, it's rather unusual to be an MSW and end up being the chair and the director of a graduate social work program in California the pleasure and the opportunity and the privilege to be able to do that. Um, my teaching experience in Humboldt County and my practice experience in the Bay Area, uh, let alone growing up as a third generation Japanese American in Southern California, uh, helps piece together in many ways, different ways of thinking and doing that I like to believe I've gotten better at pulling together at this point in my life. And so one of the things that I hope I can share with you today a little bit is I really want to talk about the importance of public service and returning the public back to public service. Because I think uh, over the years what we've seen is an attitude in this country that's been promoted <coughs> and supported in many ways to think less about people who work in public service. And you see it in a variety of ways, of retirement, of pensions, all of those things have been challenged of public service employees because implicitly there's a suggestion that public employees have been living off tax dollars um, and questioning the level of contributions that people in public 
public service that we've for many years provided for our communities. And so I really want to speak a little bit about that. Um, for those of you who might remember, um, in 1994, Harry Speck published a book called Unfaithful Angels. And I want to touch on that a little bit because 20 years later, many of the things he challenged and questioned that drew a lot of frustration in the profession as well, are still part of some of the challenges that are inherent, I think, in child welfare services. But if you'll bear with me, I tend to like to start from a very informal place in these conversations. The theme of this conference in particular is a dialogue among Title IV programs. And so what I hope I can offer you in the next hour or so it's just some ways to think about having conversations that sound a little different than perhaps we've been doing for a number of years. Because uh, one of the things that have been important to me as a social worker, as a social work educator, let alone in practice, is that we have a persistence of inequalities that we have to contend with in every realm of social work. And child welfare is no different, that we've had a persistence disparities, disproportional outcomes for young people and their families, primarily based on race and ethnic backgrounds of families in different parts of the United States. And we've known this, and we see it every year. And we acknowledge it more so now than we ever have. But we haven't defined what it requires of our profession and of our field make a difference in changing those conditions. And I think it's paramount that we begin to do that in an honest and genuine way. And I think there's some ways to do it that doesn't hold child welfare or social workers in child welfare as the sole people to address our societal inequities that we face all the time. But I think it's important because it would require a shift in the way we view child welfare services and the way we view our work as professionals. But again, I go back to that because at the heart of social work practice to me has always been social justice. And we say it in our um, programs everywhere. We say it in our um, National Association of Social Workers Code of Ethics. But I would suggest many things that we do in social work, and sometimes in our public services, is less about social justice and more about social control. And I think it's important as social workers that we are always moving in the direction of justice and less so accepting the premises that we're part of a process of control. So those things might sound a little big, so I hope you bear with me as I try to move through some thoughts because um, I would love to see us shift the dialogue and change the ways that our society talks about abuse or neglect or violence and the different ways we talk about parents and the different ways we talk about our generations of young people growing up. As I said, I'm, uh, I come out of a family in which my parents didn't speak English. Uh, my mother understood English. She could hear what people were saying. She knew what they were saying just in some ways chose not to develop her English skills to speak back to them. My father, on the, on the other hand, uh, interacted a lot, but um, learning English was difficult for him. And so he spent most of his hours working in the fields and um, mostly socializing only with a small network of Japanese families and others who grew up in the same part of Japan that his parents had. I mention this because the world I grew up in wasn't a world in which college was assumed, nor was it a world where um, anybody could imagine, let alone myself, that I would have chosen this path and this future that I've been trying to actualize for many years. But I mention it because um, in my work, I've often spent most of my time working with refugees and immigrants all different nationalities, as well as um, working primarily with African Americans and Native American communities, and then along with uh, other Asian or ethnic groups in the United States. And why 
my social work and my work, diverse communities all came together, is really around the fact that I was continually immersed in the daily lives of people and seeing how hard they worked and how hard they struggled and how many barriers they faced and how many challenges just to do some very simple basic activities. And so developing into a social worker for me was important in the sense that I felt I could actually be helpful. In the process, I learned something else that my education at Berkeley did not teach me. Um, my process in becoming licensed as a clinical social worker did not teach me. My work in mental health was the first place where things began to change for me because I was listening in particular to young people, young people of color, and the stories they would tell me and the things that they would experience. And I realized that what they did not need from me was for me to figure out solutions for their lives. What they actually wanted to experience is that somebody understood them. And I mean that at the deepest levels that you can think of about what understanding means. Not on a superficial level or not on the comment that well, you know, when you get older, you get through this, you'll change. But actually today, what I'm experiencing matters. And that I want to be able to make choices with my life today. And I want to do things that are meaningful. And once I started working together, it began to change the ways I wanted to construct programs that I was responsible for. And the more I did that, the more success I had in terms of watching young people begin to change their lives, began to work with parents who were often perceived as those unable or didn't know or didn't support their children, and actually found that most of them, given some information and some support, and then to see success in their children, actually wanted to take more active roles in their children's lives. So from a very direct practice orientation, I began to see different ways that I could work with people and begin to inform my programs, not by experts, and not by other professionals, but by parents and children and youth, and to incorporate them in decision making and incorporate them in the structure of the ways the program actually operated and responded. It might sound very simple, and um, many of us today talk about programs that are geared toward being more family-centered, increasing the voice of foster youth, for example. But I would suggest we still do it within a parameter that denies that there are greater choices, greater opportunities to pursue. And so one of the things I'm mentioning about direct practice is because my life has been a mix all the time of doing things directly with people as well as working on larger systems change. And I think that's what social work really is. And I would suggest in child welfare, one of the drawbacks that causes concerns around retention, let alone recruitment into the field, is that much of the core level of work for social workers is solely direct practice. That they carry numerous families to work with, but have very little role in impacting the conditions in which those families live. And the drawback of that is over time, what workers start to do is they start to talk to families as if they're devoid of a culture or a context in which they live, and begin to only think that the individual family members are the source of their own problems, and the resolution of life getting better is that these individuals do something with their lives, while totally ignoring the levels, in some places, of persistent discrimination, unfair treatment of people simply because they don't speak the same language, or the denial 
of opportunities simply because people are poor or struggling to maintain shelter. So what pains me is to watch our profession produce social workers who go into child welfare services with a wide range of educational knowledge, talent, and skills, and often with an enormous drive and motivation to work in some of the most difficult circumstances, and find that what is mostly expected of them in their work is to go from one family to another, often sitting with very prescribed plans, and trying to talk to them and trying to use their skills of engagement to at least help families feel more hopeful or at least engage in some of the services for things that they live. <coughs> Meanwhile, totally ignoring that the family is living in an apartment complex of substandard housing quality, that the area is littered and filled with risk, not because of their own making, but because the conditions of that apartment complex or, or that uh, neighborhood is allowed to deteriorate, unlike other parts of our cities and other parts of our communities. When we talk about poverty in child welfare services, we often talk about it as a condition that the family is in. Over the years, what's begun to happen again, which I'm quite frankly worried about, but I hope as social workers we continue to speak out against it, but there is more and more a beginning belief and repeated that people sort of choose to live in a culture of poverty and that the culture of poverty is the way people think about their life circumstances. About 30 years ago or 40 years ago, that notion of a, of a culture of poverty was actually discredited. Because most of us realize that individuals don't choose to be in poverty. That there are social forces and social conditions that create persistent poverty in people's lives because it continues to narrow the options and opportunities that they have, let alone create the suffering that they experience on a day-to-day -day basis. And it's less about people having attitudes about themselves that persist their situation in poverty, and more an indictment against their society that knowingly allows people in this country of all countries to have to live in conditions of poverty. And so as social workers who supposedly have a motivation to work directly with people, to alleviate their suffering and distress, and at the same time be committed on a systems level to engage in social change practices for more justice, for greater equality, then where is that in our child welfare services today? Because that's the work at hand. Often when I'm working with counties, and I don't say this to minimize the hard work that's involved, nor the realities that people who are suffering often behave and do things that create more distress, sometimes in their own lives, or their family's lives. But it's important because we've accepted a premise that child welfare services is really a case-by-case -case work in response to situations that are identified, rather than using our professional knowledge and skills to recognize the circumstances in which so many families face that creates conditions and experiences in which people are hurt. And that if we would work consciously to change those conditions, we would alleviate a large measure of the suffering that we have in children's and family situations that come to our attention in child welfare. I hope as I'm saying this and I'm listening to myself at the same time that I'm not sounding so much as if it's an indictment about anybody in this room. It's quite the other. Thankfully, everyone in this room is committed to child welfare, to the well-being of our children and families, whether in the academic sphere of trying to prepare new people to work in the field, as well as people who are working every day in the trenches 
and having to deal with both bureaucratic structures, political realities, as well as the suffering that families and individuals come to the attention are experiencing. I'm saying this because if we keep doing the things that we've been doing, we keep putting us back in the same situation. I've been an MSW for 30 years. I can tell you that in 1983, people were concerned about the conditions and the growth of child abuse and the issues that are impacting families. And I can tell you in California, there's been a couple of rounds, about every 10 years, of um, sort of redoing child welfare. <coughs> to be fair, we've also gotten better at making some of those changes. But I can tell you that some of the data we look at, they're always socially constructed and politically constructed. So for example, if you said to every child welfare entity, whether a state-run organization or a county-run organization, that what we need to see in order to be funded is a reduction of the number of families that come to child welfare services or enter into the system, I promise you, within a couple of years, those numbers would drop in every state and every county. But if we turned around and said, too many children and families are being unattended, and it's our responsibility as a system to ensure that every family that needs to be seen by child welfare should come into the system, I promise you, every state and every county, their numbers would go up from that. It's a problem when we are so wedded to a system of care that we've lost sight of what the purpose should be primary. So as I'm saying these things, I want you to think about a few little ways that we continue to build both hope and promise. Because what I'm trying to say by bringing this to this opportunity is not that there's a simple answer, but that it's imperative that people stop talking about the next thing to do and start thinking about what is it that will change the conditions in which families have to suffer and in which our next generation is harnessed at its best rather than somehow be resilient enough to make through it, right? We give more credence and more acknowledgement for people being resilient to withstand the challenges, the barriers, the traumas, the suffering, than to actually think that what we should be doing is ensuring that there is less trauma, less suffering, and less difficulties that people have to cross. So, one of the ways I would like you to think about having dialogue with one another is why is it that we would recognize the disproportionate and disparate outcomes of various groups in the United States? Why is it that it's so hard to stay focused on that conversation and make it the most imperative, most important, action that we take to address it. How is it possible that every year with all the new programs, new changes, evidence-based practices, that if you look at almost every state and every county, that the percentages, the proportional rate of African-American children coming into the system almost stays constant in every community. <coughs> It's not by chance. But we don't even talk about why we think that happens. I've worked with Native American communities over the last 20 years before I moved to San Diego. And one of the things that I needed to learn, and one of the reasons why we put the focus of our master's program that we were initiating at Humboldt, <coughs> on rural and Native American communities. It's because when you look at the long history of relationships, most social workers actually do not know the status of American Indian communities in the United States. (coughs) 
in order to be actually thoughtful about our relationship to indigenous communities, it would be important for all social workers to begin to think, what does it mean to live in a country in which there are other groups of people within the country that actually have sovereign rights to determine the fate of their future. And it would require us to remember why is it that there are activists at various levels in indigenous communities speaking about the importance of recovering land in various communities, about teaching and promoting values that are consistent with their indigenous beliefs, and that we would actually respect that, that we would actually value incorporating that into social work education, and that we would actually want to prepare the next generation of social workers to be able to understand the relationships and the political and historical truths that have created the kinds of turmoil and difficulties in life. Because as social workers, we claim that to be our area of practice. We're one of a very small handful of professions that claim social justice is our purpose. And it's a wonderful and significant part of our profession. And yet I would challenge all of us with social work degrees, to what extent do we value that to the point that we're willing to struggle in conversation, in partnerships, in being allies, and exploring and trying to understand our role and our place and the kinds of suffering and the kinds of possibilities that communities and families have. So one of the things that Noel shared, and um, I wish I could claim uh, to have more success, but um, I don't know how many of you are familiar with Winona Leduc, uh, an indigenous activist for many years. She actually was the, the vice presidential candidate with Ralph Nader on the Green Party ticket uh, for a couple of elections. Um, but she actually does far more important things than run on a Green Party ticket. But um, one of the things she said about uh, American society, and those of us living in it, is that, uh, if I can paraphrase it, is that basically we have um, an inability really think in a longer term. That we tend to be a culture that wants answers in a few years on major social issues. That we develop two-year plans, three-year plans, four-year plans. She suggested that what this country really needs and that what people need to do is think about developing a 50-year plan or a 100-year plan. Because without doing so, some of the situations that we think are so intractable, like poverty, like racism, requires that level of commitment and dedication to not being afraid to pursue a better situation. So here's my answer to some of the ways that child welfare agencies today can begin to work and requires social workers to actually manifest what they've learned in their schools and to practice them in challenging ways in the agency. Who's the best source of information for you? about what it's like to be a family living in a particular neighborhood or a community. I would suggest to you, it's actually the people who live in the community. And I would suggest the best practices would be to actually engage closely 
with individual families, and then neighborhoods, then communities, and to begin to have an honest dialogue about what child welfare is able to do, what it has done, and how we can work together to improve. So for example, child welfare is, um, if you think about working with newly graduated MSWs who go into work in child welfare. If I were to ask you, if you headed a child welfare agency, what is it that you want so badly? Why is it? And what is it about MSWs that you want to be doing your work? Because the honesty is in the United States, let alone in California, even in the most uh, highly professionalized counties. Most of our counties have less than 50% MSWs working in child welfare. In California, we've had a Title IV-E program over the last 20 years. Uh, San Diego State alone, I think the last time I counted, we produced over 500 people with a Title IV-E support to go to work in child welfare. And the good thing in California, actually, and, and in San Diego in particular, um, I can pull the data on each individual. And what we have is actually some people, uh, we actually have somebody who's continued to work in uh, the local county agencies since the very first stipends were offered. But on the average, it's about six and a half years of committed work um, after graduation, um, which typically is a pretty high retention rate compared to many places. But even in that environment, there's still less than 50% MSWs in the office. So if you're wanting to really retain professional staff, then you have to be able to define something different that you want for people who pursue a higher degree. Because really, you have that same person working next to someone without a social work degree, let alone a BA social work degree, doing the exact same work. And if it's only training that's required to be a child welfare worker, then why as social workers are we in the field? Because I believe it's a field that social workers must be in. Then what we need to do is rethink what it is that social workers bring and how to make it happen. One of my suggestions, and one of the things I'm testing out in different ways, is that actually one of the problems for child welfare is that it's very prone to high levels of criticism, high levels of, uh, what's the right word, being held by suits, you know, being taken to court, right? So we have two things that happen. When child welfare is viewed as the only answer in response to child abuse, so what do we do? We teach everyone to report. We teach everyone that child welfare is gonna respond. And the honesty is there's no way that any, any organization or any program or any service could at all meet the needs in a society in which inequities persist and a culture that sometimes glorifies violence. There's no way that child welfare by itself can meet the needs of every child, of every family that comes to the attention. but we've created almost a belief system that if someone is concerned about abuse, report it to child welfare services, child protection. And the end result is that the community's perception of child welfare in many places is uh, harsh, to say the least, in every situation, no matter what. So if you remove a child, there's usually somebody complaining that child welfare services 
didn't take into consideration a number of things. And there's always a wonderful news story example of how child welfare disrupted a family, traumatized a child, uh, didn't respect the parent, didn't involve them, and there's that version. The other version is child welfare um, comes to the attention because they were noticed, uh, they were, a family was reported, they'd gone on a number of times, the child continued to live at home, and one day was killed. And when people look at the situation, they go, how in the world did child welfare miss this? What kinds of social workers could ignore all these things? And why do we have an agency called Child Welfare Services when they can't even protect this child that was clearly suffering from maltreatment? And the most immediate things that most agencies do as soon as that happens is they shut down and become very secretive in a sense to be very protective. The other thing that happens that we don't often talk about is child welfare doesn't operate independently, does it, in any place. It's a vehicle for political action and it's a vehicle for political privileges that other people can promote or disengage from. That's one picture. The other picture is child welfare is the wonderful savior. And we have these wonderful heartwarming stories. The foster child who grew up in the system, leaves at 18, goes to Harvard, and everybody gets to feel good that we did such a wonderful job that we helped this young person succeed. And there are wonderful stories like that that are often told. Right? The truth is, human life is a little more messy and, quite frankly, wonderful in many ways, but very few things are impacted solely by one experience. And yet child welfare is often held to that standard. If the child comes to your attention, you should make sure that child is safe and that they have a good future. And we keep adding layers of expectations. The best way to break that, I find, is when your local community, your local neighborhood, is actually informed about the number of children in their community that's come to the attention of child welfare services, the number of children that may have been removed in order to ensure their safety, and also what happens to children when they enter into the foster care system and how many of them are able to be returned home. And if you share that information with neighborhood groups, I'm currently working with a group called Project Save Our Children. It's a uh, very grassroots African-American organization that um, vacillates between whether or not we want to become an actual nonprofit or whether we want to continue to stay in a more ad hoc way. Um, but I mentioned this group because one of the first things we did is began to disseminate all the information about the disproportional and disparate outcomes that were happening in San Diego, specifically to African American children. And it's striking because about 5% of San Diego County is African American, 4 or 5%. And in some uh, particular parts of San Diego, about 37% of the kids who come into the child welfare system are African American. In the state of California, if you just look at various disparities indexes, what you really see is about two and a half times is the um, number of entries, I believe, into child welfare system, and then the other to look at is uh, the long-term foster care situation, and it's about four times in relation to white populations in San Diego and in uh, California in general. These are rough numbers, but I think you get the point, and I think in probably your state or your county, if you look closely, they look fairly similar. 
Well, one of the things that um, Project Safer Children did was spend a number of months holding community meetings simply to tell more and more people in the community what the numbers look like. And the interesting thing about the residents in the community, African American residents in the community, is that many of them said, I knew things weren't that great because I know someone who had their child removed, or I know someone who had difficulty getting their children back. But they were amazed at the actual numbers. Because in their day-to-day -day life, they might know neighbors, or they might know relatives, and they might know a handful of people who might have had experiences over the years. But it, it overwhelms them when they begin to realize how many hundreds of children who are African American are experiencing both potentially the abuse and the neglect and the maltreatment, that's one part, but the other part is how many of them enter into the system and almost seemingly have no way to ever leave the system. And so what happens when you do that is, interesting enough, they spend less time blaming child welfare services and more time saying, we need to do something about it. And I suggest that what child welfare needs most of all is to partner with that community energy that wants to do something about it. But what actually happens is that child welfare typically avoids those interactions, generally because they're fearful of certain communities getting quite angry and believing that people will complain, it'll degenerate into just a shouting experience, and nothing good will come of it. But I would suggest to you that sometimes that anger that you have to listen to, and sometimes that frustration that comes out, is valid. And you need to have the wherewithal to accept it, to hear it, and to acknowledge it, and to allow people to get to the place where they rarely say, you need to do more, or you need to find the solutions. They typically say, we need to do something about it. So my work is always interested in working closer and closer to the ground, and particularly in neighborhoods and communities, and I consciously pick Looking at data, I consciously look at areas that either have high child welfare reports or a high percentage of particularly children of color that are being brought into the system, that allegations are being made, and that struggle. Because I know one thing, that unless they have a stable way to get their education, and then unless they have some stable housing, unless they have a place that becomes home, on a consistent basis, the likelihood that they're gonna succeed through the ages so that they get to college or to get to other successful careers in their lives is gonna be really difficult. So one of my goals has been to try to create field placements that do two things. One, that purposely attract students by telling them I work in an area in National City. Uh, it's one of the poorest cities in San Diego County. And on the west side in particular, it's one of the poorest areas in the city itself. And it's a predominantly uh, Mexican, Mexican American community. When I have the opportunity to select some MSW students coming into the program, one of the things I'm paying attention to is what are they telling me why they want to become a social worker? And when I get the opportunity, and in this case for the past three years, I've been able to ask um, my bilingual, bicultural Spanish-speaking students who are coming into the program, if you had the opportunity, if you had the opportunity to work in a community in which, and I lay out some of the negatives that are happening, but I also say the nice thing about the West Side is that it has a long history and there are residents who identify themselves as having grown up on the west side, they love staying on the west side, 
and they remember a time when the neighborhood was stronger and healthier, and there's people there who always want that. And I let them know that the principal in the community is somebody who grew up in that neighborhood, went off and got her education, has come back to that neighborhood with the sole intent of wanting to make a difference in her own community. And I promise you, it's not that hard to attract some of my new MSW students to want to be there of all places and to make a difference. I think it's true of paid staff who begin to work in agencies, rather than be solely placed in units or sent to different locations or to be placed in a different region or a different office, you could make the most of MSWs by saying to them, there are parts of our city or parts of our community that could use your talents and your skills to make a bigger difference in the system. And what we need are workers who can actually partner with the community and to listen and hear what it's like to grow up in that neighborhood and to remember it so that when they're working with families, they're thinking contextually about where this family lives, what this child experiences, and who else informal and formal supports exist in that community. I think if you did that, you find that you can retain master level social workers better. And I think that they could utilize their knowledge and their skills, not only their professional knowledge, but their cultural knowledge in a genuine way, working with families, that it would also maximize the outcome. It doesn't take more money. It just takes a different way of doing who your working staff is and what the potential for change is in every situation. So just to give you a little highlight of this little neighborhood, because it's only in the early stages, is that over the three years now, uh, my students recently who just uh, completed their internship have begun to build a parent group that's taking a much more active role in the school, doing a variety of things to support, even though they lack the English skills to particularly help with the academic side of things, but they're doing all kinds of things for fundraising, for putting on events, for supervising. They're doing a number of things because they want to participate more. The school has an attitude that it's, it's a K to college attitude, even though the history in that area is not that many people are finishing school and going on to college. But just by imposing that as a way of thinking, then when families come to the attention of child welfare, when families are at risk, they're in the school, um, the students I've had have been able to work with those families so that they don't enter into child welfare, that they are getting other supports and other encouragements that are working for them, not only in the short run, but beginning to build a pattern of support that could be there. We've also brought other uh, supporters to the area, Environmental Health Coalition, the Hunger Coalition, public health agencies, and tried to locate resources that normally would go to other parts of the city to focus in National City or in that part of National City. And I think that's our role as social workers is that each of you in this room have a place where you can advocate and make impact on the structural ways that people are living in the community. That's critical for reducing and addressing the kinds of conditions that many families have to work with. Harry Speck, um, who was the dean at Berkeley, and in the late 80s began to think of a way to attract people back to public service, to attract newly entering graduate social work students, to hopefully not think about private practice, but to be committed back to public service, began to try to search for a way to create incentives or encouragement. And in California, ultimately, that's how the Title IV programs and the California Social Work Education Center emerged. 
And when he used to talk about it in the early stages, he wasn't talking about it being simply a workforce development program. He really talked about it because he saw a need for social services to begin to change and to meet the greater needs of communities. In the talk by um, Bob Sanborn yesterday, and also in their workshop, uh, the organization Children at Risk here in Texas, one of the interesting things they said that also 20 years ago in Unfaithful Angels, Harry was pointing out, that it's critical that we also begin to believe there are certain kinds of supports for all families so that we stop only looking to create services that are interventions and reactions, but that we actually do things like create programs that are universal, because simply it would be good for all families to have those supports. And if we could make that more a goal, and to look at very key things, whether it's like childcare or others, there are multiple ways to build those supports. I think it's important, and I bring it to mind, because one of the things he said in that book, um, that people didn't even pick up on much. In essence, he said, you can't expect a profession to reform itself. The social work profession is a wonderful profession. And the most exciting thing about the profession is it has a constant opportunity to remake itself, to be more just, and to play a greater role in the welfare of our communities. I suggest that one of the things in child welfare that would be exciting to do is to move away from these specific approaches that we want to believe would make a difference and move to the discussions to the heart of the matter and to look at why we continue to persist with inequalities in this society and then choose to design services to deliver to families in a way that actually incorporates them actively, not individual families, but actually sees a collective need to address the conditions that we need. We've designed almost every kind of service we have as an individually designed response. So that even when we talk about being very family-centered, we're talking about responding to a family in such a way individually, while ignoring the contextual life that they struggle with that impacts a collective group of families at the same time. So um, I want to be on the positive side. So I hope what I'm saying is an encouragement for a kind of discussion and a kind of direction and advocacy, not as a way to discount the hard work that goes on in child welfare. Because I think at the heart of our work that people often do not talk about much anymore, and we don't describe it in our work as often as we should. But what we do best, if we do this with a genuine heart and a genuine and thoughtful mind, is that we increase the capacity for all of us, the families that are served and those of us who work to serve them, we increase our capacity to love and to be loved and to be hopeful of a future that's better. And every child and every family should be able to wake up every morning and deeply believe that tomorrow is going to be better and that today they will actually have an enriched opportunity to be happy and to see all the kinds of things that they would like. I don't mean that in a romanticized way. I'm saying that if we believe that, then we would make much more mindful and conscious choices about what we do. In these concrete things that we have, universities, agencies, 
Title III programs, internships. There are very conscious ways to maximize and to utilize them without needing any more funds or without adding other people, but maximizing what we do and to work across sharing and working together. One of the last things I'd like to just raise and just have you think about a little bit is that we've become, uh, as an education and both through contracts and through other ways, we've become repetitive in the language we use. We talk about best practices. We talk about evidence-based practices. And we pride ourselves on these things. And there are elements of it that are good, but there is no so-called evidence-based practice that actually serves every family successfully. And we know that. So once we take that one evidence-based practice, and that becomes what we implement as a solution. Whether it's a parenting program or a treatment program, what we've just guaranteed is that there is a group of people who will not benefit from the way we're delivering the service. So as much as it may benefit more people, we've also chosen to allow and know that certain numbers of people will not benefit. What's the use of doing that? We supposedly have a professional education, but the quality in our field is their ability to discern among many things what needs to be done. That's the talent and the skill that we want to cultivate in new professionals. It's not the ability to replicate existing programs and services, but the ability to discern what is required and what is needed. It's consistent with the purpose, and then act upon it. I hope, as I'm saying these things, that you recognize that I'm not trying to say there's a solution. What I'm trying to say is that it's imperative that you take the opportunity to think about these issues and discuss them in different ways so that as schools we offer a different education, as agencies we're willing to involve community at various levels. So in some communities, and this has been tried in different places, They've created citizens review committees where actually people in the committee and the community are given access to being able to review how different family situations were handled and to be able to give feedback or offer ideas of how else working with particular ethnic communities could have been done differently. That's one hindsight way of doing it. The other way is building in community partners and when I say community partners, in most child welfare organizations, that typically means nonprofit agencies. I'm talking about community partners, meaning literally residents who live in communities. But you can actually build in different kinds of advisory groups or organizations at different stages of child welfare services in order for people to be able to participate and share what they know of their communities in terms of being able to assist or support the work that's going on for families. But when you exclude that voice out of the agency, then you typically have discussions and conversations about treatment, about choices that are a-contextual, a-historical. They're done by people who actually are less familiar with the community and less familiar with the opportunities that exist. So there are multiple ways to bring community into the agency. There's multiple ways for schools to do that. And more importantly, there's countless ways to have students as part of the preparation work directly with residents, not simply from an agency perspective or from uh, a school-based or professional identity, but in a variety of ways working directly with community to understand the perspective of people who live in a particular neighborhood or a particular area. The other thing when Nana Leduc said that I appreciated in one uh, interview that she was in. So one of the problems with American society is that most people grow up 
um, without really knowing the history. And you can't make changes when you really don't understand the history which you are now part of. And I would suggest that one of the challenges in all of our fields is that people are losing sight that it's context to a historical process that's evolved to a certain point and that you're continuing to be participants in that process. If you understood the history, you'd have motivations to act differently and think differently about improving the welfare of people. As I've said these things, that um, you realize that for the years that I've also worked, and I look in the audience of many of you who have countless years' experience, we all know that the day to day work is not easy. And it's not simply either individual problems or simply larger societal issues. People need some basic needs met, but we also know that basic needs by themselves does not engender change. The issues are more complex, but the opportunities to start requires us to see the world through a different eyes. And one of the things I appreciate, particularly working with Hmong communities, the indigenous communities that I've worked with, Many of them often talk about the place of that child in the collective whole of the community, not just of those parents that they're born with or born into or a particular family, but their place in a collective world. So that the education that the child learns is frequently focused on how to be a part not separate from, but be a part of the whole. And I would suggest there are ways to value that in our work so that we stop separating families as if all families are nuclear families or even extended families by relatives, but really are part of a larger fabric of community life. The goal of families is not to utilize services, the goals of our work with our families should be that they engage more within the communities that they live and become active citizens of what we'd love to believe is a democratic society. So I thank you for your patience. I hope if I've done anything that's just asked you or challenged you to have conversations with one another. I thank you for your time, your patience. Be happy to answer any questions.